Um, this probably flows on quite well from the previous presentation because a fair bit of what we talk about will be stat sports driven and then I will contest some of the points potentially but tie into how performance is probably more contextual. So um, I thought I'd just do a, a quick overview um, I don't know many people in the room. So my background is actually education. So I started in South Australia as a PE teacher for eight years. Um, towards the end of those, I was, so I was running sport for probably 800 kids in a country um, town. And towards the end of that, I started uh, working at the South Australian Institute of Sport and almost enjoyed that more than my, my actual job in education. So I quit. Um, hand a resignation in and move to the other side of the world. Lucky mum was born here, so I could get a British passport. And yeah, I just tried to work in sport. Um, so for the students in here, just keep knocking on the door. Um, don't take uh, rejection, because I got turned down by 35 clubs as an unpaid intern. That's ranging from League Two down to um, Conference North and South. And I ended up getting one at Stevenage. When I was there, I just kept using my days off to go and learn and get experience at different clubs. And eventually I got approached by Bristol City, moved there, and then when the new ownership took over at Ipswich, I came across with Mark Ashton, like the CEO and the new ownership group. So I really do strongly encourage you to, to keep doing that. And probably my advice that I can take away from my journey so far is the relationships will be just as important, if not more important, than what you learn academically. I think that's probably really important. Um, so just a few personal beliefs to begin with. I think football is an individual sport, uh, sorry, a team sport played by individuals. And I think that probably ties into what, what Alex was saying. Like there isn't just this loading pattern that is this magic number that you can put out because every position will be different and you need to work with your S&C departments, your sports science guys, your physios, your coaches, to actually really tie that back in to get some sort of loading blueprint. And my third um, potentially contentious one is football in the UK is ingrained in tradition. Everyone just wants to do the same thing over and over. No one really wants to change. Now you'll see clubs like Brentford are forcing everyone to look at what they do and how do we actually do this. So maybe that's the Australian in me, but that's my opinion. Um, so there's so many different processes that you can actually use data for. So we use it for benchmarking players. So within our club, uh, as you get higher in the pyramid, you can get access to every club's data, like physically, um, through camera systems and things like that. So we'll start making like league, league benchmarks and and different things in those uh, points. But we have um, KPIs for each age group as we come through. We know we have to hit certain like physical standards using like our VOD technology at under 14s, under 16s, under 18s to get to where we need to in the first team. We also have this whole area of injury prevention. Um, I work across some recruitment data as well. The focus of this, before, uh, this presentation though is merely going to be a focus on our training analysis, like a very brief uh, snippet of that, and then our using that to translate into match analysis um, of a particular player and looking at trends in data. So I think data is just the beginning. I think that um, this quote is, is quite good, Like the goal is actually to turn data into some sort of information. And then from that point, information into insight. We as a club, and Nikos would know this working at the club, we collect so much data. We just have access to so much data. But if we don't have that in some sort of information form and present it to coaching staff in a way, it's not insightful, it's just numbers on a page. And I think, I think that really addresses probably what we're gonna, gonna go through today. Um, so the three categories that I'm going to talk about today are prediction, intensity, and optimization. So prediction is a model that we use for our advanced planning using like the drill databases that were highlighted before. And that's being, I like to think that's proactive load management. We're looking at intensity. This 
worst case scenario in a game? How can that be replicated in some sort of training scenario? And then optimization is the individualization of the previous two. As I said before, it's a team sport played by individuals. The loading pattern kind of has to be that way. So this is the prediction model that I've, I've built at Ipswich and that we use. Now, this is not 100% accurate. I don't think you will find one that's going to be 100% accurate. There's going to be errors in it. There'll be um, things that change from the planning phase to what actually happens, but it will minimize the error. And I think that's probably what we're really trying to do with data in general, just get as close as we can to a more accurate answer. So we get a sheet from the coaches in the morning. That sheet will then come back into our office. and We'll load up what the drills are going to be um, and the timings down here, and then it populates from that. So if we look at um, like the box sprints, for example, there's basically three teams as the ball goes in, two run from one, and that kind of flow happens. It's like a small rondo 6v2. So we know as a squad, we'll get approximately 411 meters total distance, 17 zone five, which will be pretty much the transitions, no zone six, and the Axels D cells will be about nine, uh, nine each. Now from that, we accumulate the session and I'll just draw your attention to the, the top box. I know there's a lot of color on there, but just the top box for now. So this is like our predictive output, if you like. So the top box here is for that session, which was on the previous slide, is gonna be 70 minutes. These are the distance outputs, zone five running, zone six running, and our axles, D cells. Now from that, this is our team match average that we would get throughout the season. They have to play at least 80 minutes for it to actually start going into this. So if they come off at 60, that won't affect the match outputs. And from that, we populate a percentage of match. So just looking at this, what kind of session would this be? What kind of spacing are we thinking? Uh, what, sorry? Sprinting session. Sprinting session. So this is our sprint distance. This is our percentage. I was looking at more of the accelerations. Yeah, the accelerations. So it will be a small space session. They generally, if we're, our sprint distance is low, the spaces aren't big enough for them to get up to that speed. But this will be a small space session. So generally our match day minus four will be something like this. So from that population, this left-hand side is the same graphic and the right hand side is what actually happened from the session. So with this, we were probably slightly under on our total distance, still in the ballpark. Um, our high speed running and sprint distance was fairly accurate. Axels and, axels and D cells are again, fairly accurate. As I said, this isn't the, uh, gonna tell us exactly what's gonna happen. Cause when you look, we planned 70, we did 80. So in that session somewhere, there's been an additional 10 minutes. So naturally your output will go higher. But by doing this, we roughly know what's going to happen at the end of the session. So we can plan our top ups. As um, Alex pointed out, you can just run them box to box. But what technical benefit or tactical tie-in is that? If we know this is what's going to happen and we know roughly we're going to get these numbers, we can go back to the technical coaches and kind of meet with them and say, okay, player A, B, and C need to do a little bit more work today. We can run them in this manner, or we can do this exercise with them, just doggy style running, or do you want to put a technical passing bit in or a pressing activity? And usually they will want the technical, but we're still hitting what we need for our loading patterns. But it's that collaboration between the uh, technical coaches and ourselves. Um, just moving on to the intensity. So obviously I've taken the names off this, but this each line of this is one player's maximal five minute output in, in a match. So, um, and then I've opened up a, a particular player here. 
So our highest output by any player that we've had over a five minute split is 959 meters of total distance, 127 meters of zone five, 90 zone six, um, and then these are the per minute, per minute values across that. Now, we try and prepare our players for this worst case scenario as best we can. Each week we'll try and adopt some sort of drill where they will have to do this and it is an absolute physical blow. At the end of it, they are quite, uh, quite tired. Generally, this will happen on a big space day because we need the space to hit the numbers. And this is kind of what, how Bielsa created Murder Ball because he couldn't get the numbers he wanted quick enough and so he put balls around the outside of the pitch. When one ball goes out, you throw another ball in. Coaches will have balls all around. So if you're attacking one end, you've had a shot and it goes out, they'll just throw one. So the defensive has to transition, everyone goes back, and it is still positional because the center back might have to run from the halfway line to the 18 yard box, whereas your midfielders might be outside the 18 yard box and they have to actually get all the way back. So it still has that individualization within it. But um, yeah, certain managers I've worked with probably like this drill more than, more than others. I think they like seeing fatigue, so. Um, and then the third one is the optimization. Again, lots and lots of colors. The reason I use colors is just because most people know green good, red bad. That's an easy way for coaches to interpret it. So each one of these uh, lines going across will be a player. It's grouped into um, positions. We will generally call ours wing backs, not full backs. If you are Ipswich Town followers or watchers, McKenna wants the ball. He leaves two behind the ball and everyone else goes. So kind of Leaf on one side, Harry on the other this year. They're more going forward, but they have to get back. But in line with what you're saying with fullback, their outputs compared to say three years ago are a lot higher. Um, so we call them wing backs, even though I probably, if you, you ask Kieran, he would call them full backs. But, um, but on this, we know, and again, I don't have any uh, studies uh, to prove this, but we know this, this happy place, somewhere between 220 and 260% uh, of a game. We've gone to 280 because our players that don't always play, we know we can bump up a little bit higher. Um, and that's for each metric. Now again, going back to this individualization um, talk, cause this is the percentage of a match. So this is their training total. And this is the percentage of a match as it builds and goes through. We know our center backs are gonna run less. So this player here has run 27 and it's 286. You can come down here and a 24 and it's 220% because their match load is higher. So it's all individualized. And on this side, we're trying to hit that, everyone hits green for the week, meaning they've hit 90% of their maximum speed. Again, going on to what Alex said, um, yeah, we know that's good for hamstring health. And obviously there will be some zeros in there if players are injured, etc. So we try and build this loading pattern. Our week starts on a Saturday, being the game because if it's been a really difficult game, that'll change what we do on our Monday, Tuesday. And we build into Friday being the last day. So on the Friday, we wanna be around this 260% or 220 to 260. Obviously there's considerations for that. If it's a two game week, you're probably more gonna focus on the recovery aspect because psychologically, they're gonna be more fatigued if and emotionally. So, we obviously take those uh, considerations into consideration. But if we're building in this manner from the Saturday through, we know on a Tuesday roughly what percentage players should be at going into Wednesday being our bigger space day. We can already pre-plan our top-ups. We can pre-plan maybe what drills we're gonna do or how long for, so that when we meet the coaches, we can feed that information in. Again, the data's there, but unless you actually share it with some sort of um, information to provide the insight of evidence, it's meaningless, it's just numbers on a page. Um, so just to review that, we, it's individualized, we consider the need of the individual player, 
We try and engage the technical um, coaching staff because it supports that interdepartmental inter planning. And then by doing that and engaging them in the process, it can actually become impactful. So our training data can be utilised. Moving on now into what we do with matches. So we obviously have the physical load, um, which uh, Alex alluded to. We try and tie everything into technical as well. So there has to be some sort of technical tactical. And this ideally builds the relationship. With this, if we're looking at physical, I think the key question is like, how can we actually make an impact with that data? So Alex's point was, if you run more, you don't necessarily win. That, that there is truth to that. But if you run more, what happens technically? Whether that's team or individual based. And then from that, what can we do with that? How can we get to the insight level? So from a um, physical point of view, and I didn't put the 268, was it? How many metrics? Yeah, so I didn't want to type that many, so I just may typed a few. Um, these are probably our, our key ones we look at, but there, there are 268 to choose from. What I want to do today is try and show you where, how I look at data and where, where I can get to in terms of the insight aspect. So today we're just going to look at physical data and compare it to match outcome. That's the, the focus. Where, is there a relationship between that physical data and the match outcome? Maybe, maybe not. And if so, what influences that? And Alex put six or seven up today, and we're going to look at the positional um, profile, the positional physical data. Um, so this graphic here is broken into positions. So the key of the positions is up here. And on the left-hand side, we've got the total distance. So each um, column is total distance. Um, and coming across is high-intensity distance. You will notice that our attacking midfielders and strikers who are generally your biggest runners are low for us. Has anyone been to an Ipswich match this year in here? Yep. What happens at somewhere between 60 and 65 minutes? We take our front four off. All four come off. We're, we're lucky that we've got probably a high quality squad depth. So our striker will come off. Generally, Wes on the right will come off. Generally, um, Broadhead will come off, and then we introduce Harness, we introduce Jackson, we introduce, we're, we're blessed with that, and the five sub rule probably has helped us because of our squad depth in League One. So hopefully, we can get over the line. But in this, there is a relationship between our centre backs and our attacking players. So our centre backs will run 26% higher high intensity distance when we lose games. That shouldn't be that big a shock. When we win games between our front four, we're running somewhere between 15 and 20% more high intensity distance. So there is that relationship between our outputs and our results. If we break this down further into a per minute value, so this data here is when we win, this is when we um, lose, sorry, when we draw, and this is when we lose. So I just want to focus on our attacking players because that's where we're going we're gonna to build from. So our strikers, when we win, which is generally like we kind of two per game because they're 10 counts, um, we will run 10.8 metres of high intensity distance per minute versus when we lose, that, those players run 7.4 metres high intensity distance. So that's a difference of 3.4 meters per minute, which works out to somewhere between probably 325 and 360, depending on how long the game is. So this kind of starts adding to that story of, well, maybe there is something between our attacking players and our match outcome. But again, to, to tie this in, we need the technical. So stats, stat sports, in my personal opinion, is the, the gold standard. I mean, Alex can't come up and say that, but he basically said it, didn't he? Um, <laughs> they are like the gold standard. And for us, stats bomb 
the technical metrics are, are the gold standard for us as well. So isolating the physical, look, the graphs we've just looked at, if I put them in front of a manager, they're just going to say, yeah, but it's context to the game. There's no real clarity or context to it, and it's a fair point. So we're going to now start looking through a technical lens. So it gives the context. Most importantly, it speaks the coach's language. That's what they care about. So we're building that relationship. And also, chances are players will respond better to a technical than a physical. Probably because they associate physical with hard work. But So this is one of our strikers. Um, this is his touches in the box for the year. So you can kind of see our um, different home and away. I've anomalized who it is. As the data goes up and down, they will, this includes sub appearances. So this is every appearance they've made. The reason I picked touches in the box is there is a strong correlation between goals scored and touches in the box. Most strikers will care about scoring goals. Um, so how can we now utilize this to tell the story we're trying to tell? And I know I used per minute before and you could use per minute for this and it would show basically the same thing. But So this now is the red column is the same player, zone five running. The green on top is their zone six running, so combined is their high intensity distance. The blue is their touches in the box and the numbers are when they score goals. So by layering the data, we can actually start seeing a little bit of a trend happening here. So if I was speaking to the player or, or a coach about this, when you run at high intensity distance, you are getting generally more touches in the box. When you're generally getting more touches in the box, such as like these three, you are scoring goals. So if you run more at high intensity, you will score more goals at its crux. Now a player can't control how many touches of the ball they get in the box because they could be open but not get given the ball. But they can control how much high intensity distance they run and how much effort they actually put in. Our particular focus and the reason I used attacking players is because it's not a 96 minute game for them. It's a 60 minute game because we bring them off most weeks at that time. So they can really run and run. And um, yeah, Kieran is probably quite quite demanding in that sense of our, our strikers putting a, that effort in. But when you sit down with coaches, they can understand, well, yeah, there is a significance between the high intensity distance and the amount of touches in the box. And there is, for the player more so, there's a correlation between the touches in the box and when they score. So they're going to kind of buy into that as well. So just kind of, again, to summarize, I think, there's so many metrics. I think we said 268 stats bomb have, I don't even, I don't even know how many, probably about the same, maybe double. They're, they have everything. Um, so all these combinations can come together. But what does that mean? So specifically, I think it's important to go, what do you actually want to analyze? So what are you, and then when you look at the outcome, what are you trying to find? And in terms of relatedness, do the metrics that you're picking, such as touches in the box or high intensity distance, actually relate to that outcome? Because if they don't, it's going to be probably a, a long hunt through data for you. As I said at the start, data is just the beginning. I think data leads to information. Once you analyze the information, you can provide insight. If that's not happening and we're not tying together, if we sit alone as a performance staff, we're not going to have the insights or the impact that we could have it is really important. And I think from what I hear from other practitioners, other countries potentially do it better than us at the moment. But so we're obviously just trying to, to evolve and get better. I, I traveled to the United States last year and I found over there in NFL, there's a huge inter-collaboration, like everything the performance guys do, the technical are involved in and vice versa. And I think that's really where we need to, to go 
to improve um, in UK football. I think data is only as good as the user as well, the person using the data. So if you're not comfortable with data, I would suggest you, you probably try and get better at it because that's probably the way the game's going. But at its crux, I actually think data is probably only as good as the question that the user is posing. Because if we're asking the wrong questions, not even data can save us at times. I've tried. But thank you for that. Thank you for your time. So I would like to open the floor for any question. So get the opportunity to, for the local uh, students, local guys, to ask to the head of performance situation some questions. Also, questions that uh, we cannot answer, maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the case of, but, uh, any question, please? Yes, Jordi. Hi, Andy. Hello. I'm Jordi from Spain. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, in your experience, uh, how many sessions or weeks or number of tasks would you need to get like a decent amount of data to yeah. try to predict or try yep. to um, for Yeah, I think, I think we started when we had done the drill only two or three times because you have to start somewhere. Um, but obviously the more data, the more times you do that drill, the more, I guess, accurate the data becomes. But yeah, you have to probably start somewhere. So we started and then, yeah, probably two or three weeks, I think. So most sessions were done maybe somewhere between two to four times. We started predicting what was gonna happen and we were probably significantly uh, less accurate than we are now, but now we've got I think about 18 months of doing like the same drills. And if spaces change by four or five meters, we'll change the drill. So it's a different drill. Um, generally the manager will use, or the coaches will use similar spaces repeatedly for the same drills. So it does make that easier. But yeah, I think you, you're probably two or three weeks and then it will get more accurate over time. And also uh, I saw one of the tables you presented. Yep. Like the weekly individual yep. match day. Yep. Well, yeah. Match day comparison. Yep. You had like two different legends. Yep. And I didn't understand. We had like the, the eight, 80, 90 percent. Yeah. So the one on the right hand side. Yeah. This one. Yeah. This one here is solely for this max speed column because obviously we don't want every player to hit 260 percent of their max speed for the week. So this will be isolated. Um, everything from this that way is the key on the left. Um, the, the purpose of this is because throughout the week, somewhere between that Saturday through to the Friday, we want players to hit minimum 90% of their, their max speed for their hamstring health. So that runs on a, on a separate, um, separate system. Would that be just one one? So it, reach one time? Uh, it depends. So some will reach it on the Saturday in matches. It is unlikely that they will hit the over 90. Generally, there'll be high 80s then it will be deliberately run on a Wednesday for everyone. The players who don't play will run it after a match. So we'd probably get minimum two per week um, above 90, but generally in drills in bigger spaces, you may get it as well. Um, crossing and finishing is probably one that gets quite close, depends on how big the run into the cross is. But yeah, that's probably one of our higher ones as well. Uh, that would be a minus three. Yeah, so our minus two is our low day. Yep. Thank you. That's okay. Pleasure. Any other questions from the audience? Kevin, please. Uh, thank you, Andy. That's fantastic. I just had a question around uh, how you manage the conversations with coaches throughout the week. Collecting so much data, I can, I'm assuming it's uh, quite overwhelming to feel like you have to report so much. But from your personal experience, how have you evolved with those conversations? and? Um, is there any insight to us younger practitioners into how to tap into the coach's knowledge and get yeah. some buy-in on the data that you have? Carefully <laughs> is probably the best one. Um, no, I think I'm selective. I, I think you ha need to be selective. If you've got three, four, five things, which happens probably most days you can go with, I think I like to probably almost put my education hat on a little bit and sit back and what can I actually have an impact with or what's going to be the most impactful? I can't deliver five or six things because they'll probably switch off after one. 
So I'll just take the one that I think is the, the most paramount or the one that I know that they will engage with or they can control. That's probably, um, yeah, probably my advice. I think earlier on in my career, I used to take everything and doors got closed quicker um, and I didn't understand why. Now I more understand why probably. And so, yeah, I think we're quite good at selecting what to take and when to take it. I think timing is everything as well. Um, if you can catch coaches when they're casually sitting around having a tea or coffee, just chatting, it's your best in. Or hand delivering the report because they'll look at it and rather than having 10 comments on it, I pretty much just have averages and maybe one comment because it will start the conversation. Conversations are always better than words on a page, in my opinion. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Any other questions? We have time for the last. Thank you. Uh, actually, is a question open to the both last speaker. Okay. Um, both, of, both of them never mentioned the collaboration with uh, video analysts. Yes. Um, for example, I'm speaking with you yep. about football and with him about rugby. Yep. Uh, you, you spoke about football and about the distance of the striker, yep. but uh, probably there is a massive difference between uh, if uh, the distance run is, uh, was very effective for, uh, for the action or yeah. not. Yep. And for the rugby, uh, I know that uh, uh, the Italian national team is trying to find uh, a way to um, analyze the data of impact uh, with, uh, with video analysis to understand from which angle and uh, calculate uh, how strong is the impact because with the GPS uh, it's quite impossible now to understand how strong is the impact. So I want yeah. to understand from yeah. both if you try to collaborate with them yeah. in which way and even with, with analysis system. Yeah, so it's I'll be honest, it's harder at League One. So when I was at Bristol City, we'd get everyone's data split into in and out of possession. And you can kind of then start marrying, that's almost makes half the work straight away. And then you can start marrying up with like, yeah, video analysts. If we, if we want to know when they're hitting certain speeds or there's constant sprints, you can tie in to work out which way the player is actually running on that because obviously that ties into, are you actually just running because you're doing a recovery run and you should have intercepted the ball earlier, or is it you're running in behind? Um, we do work with our um, video staff to do uh, that kind of collaboration, that kind of work, um, but I believe it is a lot easier as you go higher. I don't think sport will ever get to a point of like Paul Bradley's work. I think it's amazing how he breaks it all down but if I did a report on a match and give, gave that to a coach, that's going straight in the bin. No, it's not being looked at because it's too detailed. And I think, yeah, I think kind of tying in Kevin's question as well, it's about teaming up with video analysts to get the one point that you want to get across and then delivering that rather both of you going in with multiple.